Welcome to another episode of Conduct Detrimental. Dan lost back in the hosting seat alongside my co-pilot, Mike Kravchenko. What is up, my pal, Mike? You know, uh, not much. You know, we I was sick last week. I appreciate, uh, you know, everyone, you know, everyone's concern. I'm sure everyone was so, so concerned that your co-pilot was missing, you know. I don't think anyone realized, Mike. I don't think anyone, it's almost like you weren't sick at all. Um, so generally we've been pretty good recording on like Tuesdays or Thursdays, you know, we pick our spots. Um, and then, you know, behind the scenes, uh, we, I, I got a late invite to the Yankees game on Tuesday night and I'm like, kind of have to go to the Yankee game, right, Mike? I had to kind of go. Uh, yeah, it's not kind of, you have to go. It kind of had to go. It was free tickets to the Yankee game with, with some friends from my town. I had to go to that. And then, uh, I went to Philadelphia to speak at Temple Law School at their, at their, uh, Law Review Symposium, Wednesday, Thursday, and then I was cooked Thursday, and I'm like, let's record Friday, and Mike's like, I'm I'm on my deathbed, I might die, I'll do it for you, Dan, like, but I'm probably going to die and lose my vocal cords permanently if I speak, and I'm like, you know what, Mike, I'm a nice guy, we don't have to do it, let's just roll to next week. The, the loyal audience who's been with us for years and years, they're going to be okay, they're going to they're gonna realize that we're fine. Mike, some of them might have thought you died, um... Or I died, but here's the good news. We're not dead. We're here. It's a great day. Yeah. You know, you claim that I wasn't sick. I, I can show the receipts. I can show the the tissues uh, if you need. But I, you you keep your I don't I don't know what you were getting to, and I'm assuming you were not gonna say you keep your your dirty tissues. That would be disgusting. No, it's just the garbage has yet to go out yet. So, you know, let me know. Probably should be cleaning your garbage more frequently than that. Um, okay, so let's let's cover a couple things. Um, we are on the eve of well, we are we are celebrating the WNBA championship. We're going to talk um, very briefly about the WNBA CBA um, issues. We have a uh, Jake Cutler DUI on the docket. Jamison Williams back to being suspended for PEDs this time, and Deshaun Watson. Um, I thought that was terrible. The you deserve it chance. Did you hear that? So, yeah, that wasn't that. Yeah, that, let's just say that was not real. That was a, you know, a uh, clipped in. Uh, oh, those were WWE clipped in audios. That, we, uh, we will talk about that, that is actually it did sound it did sound a lot like WWE. But we're going to talk about what is a uh, I think the writing of the book of the Deshaun Watson chapter. Um, reminder, podcast sponsored by Thebus Bar Review, top bar prep company in the entire galaxy. Um, by the time you, you're listening to this, you might have already found out if you passed the bar or didn't pass the bar. Um, let's just say, if you passed it, congrats. If you didn't, we're here. We're here. Mike and I are here to be your co-pilots through this and, and as his theme is. So um, if you are a loyal listener of the show and you need some advice on um, job stuff, bar stuff, I'm generally pretty good. I try to talk to at least, Mike, I'm pretty good. I try to talk to at least two to three students or, or young lawyers a week. And then sometimes I get inundated and with all good intentions, I um, don't get to talk to as many students as, as reach out, but I am working my way through my inbox. Sometimes you might reach out in like August and you get a random email from me in October, like I'm ready to go. And, um, you know, it's, it's fine. As long as you and I don't die, like we're good. We can talk in October, November, as long as we're still on this earth, I'm still happy to have a conversation. Fair? That's very fair. No, I like that. Okay. So um, I have a hot take that you did not expect, and then we'll, we'll talk some, uh, uh, some current sports, and we'll get into the fun stuff. Um, Mike, I, I owe you my deepest condolences. Oh, I'm I'm ready for this for sure. The death of this uh, oh my god Mets season, this grimace season. This was this was like the special Mets team. They're gone now. It's over. Yeah, this was Done. a lot of fun. Uh, you know, it's very it's very fun. And in, in typical Mets fashion, it does not finish in a championship because what you have to do as a Mets fan is enjoy the small things. And for Really, uh, the whole most of the season, you know, uh, if you cut out a good third of it, um, it was a good time. And yeah, let's go Mets still very bright future on that same day. The Jets season kind of died, but the Liberty won a championship. So uh, a lot of bittersweet moments uh, that entire night. But yeah, the Mets, I'm ready to hear this take um, you know, from you. Um, I have a couple takes today, so we'll, we'll do this one quick. Um, this one you're not going to find too controversial. Um, maybe some of our listeners were. I went to the Mets playoff game, game three with the Phillies the week before, okay? 7-2 game. The game was a blowout. 
uh, the Mets Arena or Mets Stadium, City Field, was electric, electric. It was more like a concert than any sporting event I went to. Um, it was incredible the vibes. And, like, you know, I'm a San Fran Giants fan, but I, I root for the Nets. I root for uh, the Yankees. And I wanted to see the final out because I wanted to see how these Mets fans would react. So uh, Mets fans, 10 out of 10. The game wasn't really in doubt for very long. Um, I was so impressed by the Mets fans. Mike, ask me what my experience was at Yankee Stadium the next week. I would imagine uh, a bit of both, but mainly, I mean, mainly it's got to be somewhat exciting. I mean, it's a playoff. Mm -hmm. It's a playoff game Mm -hmm. in the Bronx. Okay. Obviously very exciting. The Bleacher Creatures, very excited. And this is my own opinion. I was there. I watched it. I've gone to Mets and Yankees games my whole life. The Mets generally suck. The Yankees are always pretty good. This is relevant to the analysis. 6-2. 6-2. The game is 6-2. It's similar vibe. 7-2, 6-2. They're both non-clinching games. They're both pretty important, both home games. Um, and 6-2 game versus 7-2. By the ninth inning, I'd say about in the vicinity of half of Yankee Stadium was empty, whereas that was not the case at the Mets game. Maybe it was like 95% of capacity. So there is something very different about Yankees and Mets fans. Like Mets fans... Listen, I'm going to get in trouble if I say that Yankees fans aren't diehard, but there is something that says, like, we haven't won since 86. We won in 69 before that. And the Yankees, like, this is their second longest uh, championship drought in their history. I believe the the longest was, like, I think it was 77 or, or the late Reggie Jackson Yankees to 96. That was, like, 18 years. I was looking at this the other day. And now this is 15 years, 2009. Um, but, like, 15 years isn't that much. Like, the Yankees, the Mets last one in 86. Like, I have, I'm born in 88. Like, my friends have never seen a Mets championship. You have never seen it. Um, so I think Mets or Yankees fans are just, like, a little spoiled. I think that's the easiest way to explain it. And I think Mets fans, I think they want it more. I mean, I, I really – that's my take. I think Mets fans, I think on, on the hierarchy of, like, passionate about their team winning a championship, I think Mets fans are here. Yankees fans are high, but, like, Mets fans might be number one in all baseball. It's very possible. You'll definitely be hearing from – some some lawyers uh I'll, I'll tell you that but uh no i definitely how can you not the mets like you said you not even just taking it for granted i think just the fact that the yankees are i mean the most popular brand in sports really uh, i think there's a lot more generalists at these games rather than their diehards uh, myself included kind of but i stayed i stayed and the other people did not um, okay, let us get into the topics. I guess we'll save some of the betting stuff for the end. I have some NBA futures. Uh, we, you and I are still riding high on our Caitlin Clark bet. Um, uh, for those, I think I sent it out to 12 people. Um, it was originally going to be 10, and then we got some two stragglers that said they wanted some merch. So I'm a gracious host. Uh, we paid for it out of our own budget. We sent everybody their swag packages. Appreciate all the pictures that people sent wearing and trying that stuff on. We'll do another drop at some point. Um, Andrew Gagnon, friend of the show, has come up with some new designs. Uh, I'm not ready yet for some new merch, but we, we will drop it at some point. Okay. Um, we talked about, uh, we're going to talk about Jay Cutler, Jameson Williams. We're going to talk about WNBA and CBA. We're going to talk about the uh, Fakakta ending, uh, not last night, but in the Liberty Finals. Um, and we talk about Deshaun. But before we do that, I have a bone to pick. I have a bone to pick with a certain uh, NFL AP writer. Okay, Mike, um, do you remember when I was talking a couple episodes ago about my big NFL future was Sam Darnold comeback player of the year? Are you familiar with this? I was, uh, yes. All right. Okay. Um, who won comeback player of the year? Let's say if you noticed. I remember we talked about this. Former Jet. Joe Flacco. Right? Joe Flacco. Interesting. Joe Flacco. Um, did Joe Flacco get injured or he just like kind of made like a comeback to the NFL? Yeah, he's just an old, just an old man, quote unquote. <laughs> um. I mean, there have been many players that have been injured, like Alex Smith, and there have been other players that just kind of like made a general comeback. So last year, the NFL was apparently a little bit um, – I, I don't know if the NFL is going to say this. Let's just say it. I think there's a reading of the events that the NFL wasn't thrilled that Flacco won the comeback play of the year over DeMar Hamlin, who literally like survived death and came back. So the, the NFL issued this guidance in June, which I was aware of it, um, but also the books were aware of this. So I'm just going to just going to read this. So on October 11th, Rob Motti, uh, who is, a, I guess, an AP NFL writer, has the following tweet, which has not made me very happy and set off a storm which ruined my bets. OK, you ready for this? OK, as of October 11th, 2024, 
Okay, Sam Darnold was leading the undefeated Minnesota Vikings. He was the favorite to win comeback player of the year. I think he was around even money. And I had got that exact price at like 25 to 1. So I'm sitting here with an incredibly valuable ticket for Sam Darnold. And the books have priced him as the favorite. Okay, that's that's the background that people need to know. And yes, this is a legal topic, I promise. Okay, Rob Motti, I think is how you pronounce his name, sends the following tweet, October 11th. Vikings quarterback Sam Darnold probably would have been a candidate for the Comeback Player of the Year award before the AP issued guidance to voters before the season, instructing them that, quote, the spirit of the award is to honor a player who has demonstrated resilience in the face of adversity by overcoming illness, physical injury, or other circumstances that led him to miss playing time the previous season. Okay. Again, there's a lot of commas in here. Overcoming illness. Okay, I don't think Sam Donald had like COVID or anything that like I don't know, really bad. Well, is being a is being a jet an illness? Didn't didn't he have like mono at some point? Wasn't he that did. he did, did have mono? mono. He did have mono. I, maybe I should break this up with Rob uh, Rob Monty. Physical injury, okay, or other circumstances that led him to miss playing time the previous season. The third one, the other circumstances that led him to miss playing time the previous season was anything it could be absolutely anything any other circumstance that caught him to miss playing time the previous season last i checked sam Darnold didn't start like 18 games last or 17 games last year he was riding the bench he was like kind of mixing and matching and he's well, he was not a full-time starter at any stop that he was at in san francisco carolina so that is an other circumstance that caused him to miss playing time so this award can go to anybody right joe flacco was a guy who made it come back and won the award so anyway i sent this tweet and i don't i i, I read this tweet to you I don't think this tweet should have been that big of a deal. Who's Rob Motti? I've never heard of Rob Motti. Maybe Rob Motti's a big deal. I'm not aware of Rob Motti. This tweet, audience is going to have to trust me on this, went viral. 2.8 million views. And you know what happened to my Sam Darnold futures? Do you know what happened to them? What happened? Poof. Gone. Out of thin air. Sam Darnold is taken off the board. And now Kirk Cousin is all of a sudden favored to win the award because of this tweet. Because of a tweet reminding people of some guidance that happened in June, which is nonsense and garbage why does rob rob Motti knows more than the books the books praise placed sam darnold at a, as an even money like plus 100 guy so i think this is nonsense um this is you know we're week seven of the nfl season if sam darnold continues his ascent and marches the minnesota vikings to the playoffs and, and, a, and a one seed or a two seed you're gonna tell me that he's not eligible for comeback player of the year when joe flacco won it the year before nonsense garbage um I'm just going to say I'm I I'm not going to be a happy lust if someone with a, a quarterback with a worse statistical line than Sam Darnold wins this award. There might be a war here. I might go after them like we did. Um, do you remember our friend with Dr. Pepper, Gavin White? We went after Dr. Pepper. Yes, I'll yes. go after Rob. I'll go after Rob Motti. I'll go after the AP. I will. I will burn this this t establishment to the ground. This is an incredible injustice. I want people to flag this and. As it gets closer, if Sam Darnold is in the territory of when he comes back to the late of the year, I'm happy to, to make my grand return to, to Twitter and, and advocate in a completely biased manner. But I do think this is incredibly unfair. And I think Rob Motti uh, potentially found an enemy um, on the show. It's one, one of us. Either you or I is an enemy of Rob Motti. Hey, if you're an enemy, ha, he's got two enemies. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. We're on it. He goes, he, he's like so coy at the end of this tweet. He goes, if he keeps playing at this level, Darnold could end up with another award. Most valuable player. I didn't bet him for most valuable player. I bet him for comeback player of the year, Rob Motti. Okay. It doesn't help me if he's the MVP. This guy, Rob Motti. He's just this guy. This guy. Um, okay. Anyway, speaking of things that were uh, potentially rigged, um, let's talk. We'll, we'll do we'll do WNBA first because we have a lot of football topics. Otherwise, and I don't want to lose sight of, of what I think is a big story. Um, Mike, you might be the biggest uh, Liberty fan I know. Hey, thanks. This is my first season as a fan, and I just got uh, you know super into it. I love it. I'm ready to listen to this uh, nonsense though that you're probably about to. I got a lot of been reading online. Yeah, I got a lot of, I don't know what's going on. I've been taking off a week. I just, you know, you put the tinfoil hat on me, and I got a, I got a lot of uh, different conspiracy theories. We're also two weeks out from the, the general election, and I'm just, like, so entertained by all these, like, theories that are floating out there, like, that uh, both sides are accusing the other of creating um, a hurricane to, to destroy homes in the South, which I think is insane. But you, you hear these things. These things are out there. Um this one, I think, is a little less crazy. I have workshop this. I, I told it to my class last night at, at New York Law. Um, and I tell it to anybody I think is listening. I, I, okay, so let's let's paint a little bit of background. New York Liberty um, 
Was it their first finals ever last year? Is that right? Uh, no, the not. They've lost many. That's uh, in the finals. Lost, yeah, they've lost. I right. believe four or five finals before that. Okay. This past year, the Liberty win their first ever championship in the 29 year history of the franchise. Um, it's in the same level, you know, not as bad as the New York Mets, but in those same levels. And who are the Liberty? The Liberty have Brianna Stewart. They have John Quill Jones. They have Sabrina Ionescu. Uh, they're like a star studded bunch. They're a super team. They're in a huge market. They're playing at the Barclays Center. Like they have everything you should want in a super team. So you would think, all things being equal, like New York giant market, all the conspiracy theories people say in terms of like uh, New York getting favorable calls. Um, New York's playing the Minnesota Lynx in the final, which have a fantastic team. The odds were a little fishy. Bill Simmons uh, addressed this on his show, uh, Bill, Bill Simmons podcast earlier this week, that like the the live series line for Minnesota never really made sense because they were always a huge dog. And it was almost like the books knew that the fix was going to be him. So fast forward. This was not a tremendously um, good showing for, uh, you know, I think the shooting quality on the on the Liberty. Uh, you know, Sabrina went one for 19. Uh, I think Stew, Stewie was like four for 15. Like, it was just a very porous effort. Generally, when like two of your three best players, and, and John Cole Jones had a good game, like not, not like a spectacular, like decent game. Um, but if your two stars shoot that poorly, it's almost impossible for you to win a game. It is just almost possible. That is unless you have a three to one free throw discrepancy. Mike, three to one free throw discrepancy in a deciding game in the WNBA finals at home. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what some of the post game comments meant for basketball. And I do think it's going to help. I, I don't think you have to squint that hard. I think the WNBA certainly wanted the Liberty to win and the box scores. It's almost impossible in the history of, of, professional basketball, men or women's. I looked this up. Jason Tatum once went one for 18 in a win in a regular season. And it was like the worst shooting performance in a win in the history of men's basketball. I don't, I don't have access. No, no one's run the numbers for me on, on Sabrina Nescu. I'm going to say it's probably the worst shooting performance ever for someone that won in a playoff game. Um, so it makes you raise your eyebrows that like, yeah, like everything was in place for the fix to be in. Was the fix in? I have no idea, but um, let's just say it's, incredibly healthy for women's pro basketball for the Liberty to win a super team. Um, and for this speech with Joe Sy, you know, and, and the new ownership coming in and moving the team from the Westchester Knicks arena and moving them to the Barclays center and all these pictures uh, and Sabrina and Escu shot and the game, you know, the game saving shot. Like I just think it all lines up. It's not like such a hard conspiracy theory that like, Oh, the Democrats or the Republicans created a, a weather virus and, you know, hit the South. Like, I don't know, this makes sense. Everyone with a rational brain thinks it makes sense. Um, and Mike, here, you're the Liberty fan. Do you think the game was rigged? Uh, no, I mean, listen, I don't think it was rigged straight up uh, at all. I think, yeah, the calls were crazy. I think overall the refing was crazy the whole series. Game four was flipped the other way. It was double for the Lynx, and it was absolute garbage. Uh, game one was pretty suspect as well. Obviously, yeah, they want to squeeze and uh, yeah, they squeeze out the money and drag on the series. Game and five is money. Game the five Lynx is also missed. I mean, McBride missed a wide open three at the end of the game to win it. They they missed so many opportunities that may yeah, maybe listen. Would the league have been upset? I doubt it. But uh, yeah, <laughs> reality is yeah, the New York Liberty needed to win that. Um, as you said, yeah, the worst uh, shooting performance. I've seen all season from uh, the last two games, really. And well, it's incredible they even won, to be honest. So maybe, listen, is, did the refs help them? As uh, it, with my Liberty colored glasses, you know, the uh, teal or whatever the color it's is. Good color. It's a good color. It's a great color. Hey, listen. Yeah. It's, a gr it's a great atmosphere. Like everything around the Liberty brand, uh, it needed to happen. So, and boo-hoo to the Minnesota fans who have seen four championships, uh, you know, recently especially so i don't you know what's funny this. you know what's funny WNBA exists in this bizarre world like that liberty won a championship like we'll see hopefully the yankees win they haven't had a title in, in new york in a you know i think it's been a, i think it was the yankees championship the last championship is that possible in new york no the giants 2012 20, 2012 okay so it's been legitimately 12 years we are spoiled now the liberty just won so they broke that streak right um minnesota sports teams are cursed Right. Like other than the Lynx, the Vikings are cursed. The Twins are cursed. We can go down our, our various sports teams. Um, like, I don't know, they won four titles. 
Interesting. Interesting. I just point things out. Very interesting. Okay. Um, while we're on WNBA, let's discuss this one quick. Right after the season was over, the uh, WNBA players opted out of their CBA. Um, it's not going to be the first time. Oh, it's not going to be the last time we talk about the story, but we'll, we'll just have to see what comes of it. There's so much more money coming into the WNBA that it, it just, I mean, this was almost a given. Uh, they were going to opt out of the CBA and, and try to negotiate better terms for themselves. Um, let's just see, like, you know, whenever you have an opt out of a CBA and, you're, and you don't have necessarily, quote unquote, labor peace, uh, you always risk potential of, of missed games and whatnot. I, me personally, like, listen, I don't I don't think you ever bet just in the history of sports and work stoppages and lockouts and strikes. You certainly don't you don't root for it, number one, and you don't think it'll happen because usually these things get resolved. Um, I just will point out and again, I'm happy to be wrong. There has so much change in the WNBA this past three, four years. Like, I, I, I don't, I, I think this is, if you were a part of the WNBA, you know, uh, players leadership, this is the time to strike uh, and to try to enact change right now. And the sport seems to be, uh, you know, on this incredible upward trajectory. Um, I think there's some flaws, like, you know, you and I are talking about the Liberty game. We're probably a small segment of the audience that had the Mets game on with the Liberty on on the second screen. And I don't know why those games are being shown on Sunday night. It doesn't make sense. And why during the... And the Jets were on. Of New York, come on. About... <laughs> yeah, I don't. I mean, today's Tuesday. Like, why wouldn't the Liberty Finals be like tonight? Like, I guess you're competing against the NBA. That's probably why. Um, but that doesn't explain why they weren't on previous Tuesdays and Wednesdays and whatnot. Um, I just think there is there is change to be made, and I think with the way that the WNBA has handled the season, which was a really successful season, all things considered, I just think some decisions around the product were made very poorly. Um, so let's see. I'm rooting for the WNBA. Again, I have two little girls at home. Um, they like watching women's sports. We had like women's pro volleyball on the other day. Girls were loving it. So I am hoping that the WNBA can be that guiding light for the NWSL, uh, the Women's Pro Hockey League, um, all of the above. So it's coming from a good place. Um, okay, Mike, let us, let's hit football. Um, and then, uh, again, I, have, I don't want to keep anybody waiting, but I, I have Sam Donald bet as a winner. Um, Caitlin Clark bet. It, it was obviously winning the Sam Donald bet. If I get screwed on this, I will get so angry. But I, I have an interesting bet. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I, I've done the research on it. I'll save it for the end of the show. Um, is it juicy if I tell you it's a 55 to 1 bet? Oh, that, well. <laughs> that, that's very <laughs> that's juicy. Crazy. That's very juicy. I have I have something maybe Uh-oh. against the Sam Donald bet in terms of it being in a lock. But I don't know. If I, are, you, are you about to tell me this? Fakakta rumor about them attempting to trade for Matt Stafford because I don't buy that. No, no, no. Just someone that probably will win comeback player of the year over who? Sam Darnold. Ricky Pearsall, who got shot and is now wide receiver one. In yeah, if, if, we're gonna, if we're just going to if we're just going to give the award to people that had some traumatic injury and like they came back, like I'm, Demar Hamlin should have won the award last year. The guy literally was brought back to life on the on the field. So like. That somehow that doesn't win the award, but Joe Flacco wins the award. But the next year, Ricky Pearsall, who got shot, who, you know, again, like really tragic, but like we don't call this like the comeback from injury award. It's the comeback player of the year award. And if you look through the history of the award, which isn't broken, like plenty of guys have won just having a really good season. So like the NBA has most improved player. I don't know. Maybe DeMar Hamlin is most improved player because he was close to not living and then is now a functional starter on the bills. Like, and I can make the definitions, whatever I want, but who is Rob Motti to come out here and the books listen to him. That's the crazy part. I don't mind someone going on an AP writer and NFL writer. Again, I'll get off Sam Darnold in a minute. I'm so angry about this and it's, and I was angry about this for a week straight and I'm still angry about it. The books listen to this guy. It's one thing. So I have, I've told a lot of people about this bet. I told people before the bet to make the bet of a lot of people maybe some listeners of the podcast that took this bet as well. And I'm sitting here and I'm like, the books were aware of that guidance. I was aware of that guidance, but that said, we got the money and good before Sam Donald was a starter. So obviously we're happy here. Sam Donald shouldn't have been on the board if he's not eligible for the criterion. So I'm very angry at a couple of things, but like the books had him on the board. Okay. I'm, I'm going off on a tangent, but July, August, September, like, October, October 11th, and then because Rob Motti sent a tweet, we take this off? Shenanigans. Shenanigans, okay? Shenanigans, the books. Hey, Rob Motti, Grotti, you watch The Office? You never know. 
Who's Grotty? Is Grotty the, the um is Grotty the, the, the trash disposal guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when Andy uh know. dressed up in the uh repair suit. You never know. Yeah. Uh, what's that? Then he's the is is that the insurance guy? Yeah, the insurance guy that uh, oh, tries to sell the insurance. That was a great call. That was such a good know. call. That was a great call. Um, okay, I'm off. I'm off that. Okay, let us talk, uh, Mike. I'm going to give you the floor. Jay Cutler's DUI. Um, you know, we talk about the topics good and bad, but tell us about what happened with Jay Cutler, and then uh, I'll, I'll see if I have anything to add. On it. I think I think you might have this one. Yeah, no, another quarterback. Uh, of course, this time, uh, you know, he's been in the news a bit since retiring. This time he was arrested in Tennessee uh, for crashing and he's facing a few charges. He got out, um, you know, on bond uh, at that night. But yeah, he was uh, driving under the influence and he had a possession of a handgun while he was under the influence. And then another charge, failure to exercise due care to avoid a collision and implied consent. And the craziest part, about this what that was really getting headlines and running through twitter uh was that the driver of the other vehicle that he hit told that the told the authorities that cutler actually attempted to flee the scene and offer the guy two thousand dollars if he did not call the police so uh no idea what the damage was or if two thousand dollars would have come even close to taking care of uh the situation but yeah the any anyone in the on scene, the officers, uh, the other person who was involved in the accident. I mean, they described him. He was staggering, swaying. He was just hit all the criteria for a DUI. Uh, so it's again like there's been conversation people around him uh, that have just been that that have come out and made statements and been like, you know, that they're just hoping he gets help because this is something that I guess has been a common occurrence since he retired and. Uh, He's say, hey, listen, he, uh, he's it's been a while since he played in the NFL. Um, so I don't know what much else is going to come from this or but probably nothing. Probably I mean, nothing. He's, he's Jay Cutler. So uh, hopefully not. You know, we won't see many more headlines, but feeling, you know, uh, it's just a former quarterback. So we're going to hear about it every time. And uh, yeah. Um, no, I think that's fine. I mean, we've got to talk about it. You know, he's not involved in the sport, um, but still a headline when, when, you know, I think what is a relevant headline. Um, I, there's one thing that we didn't put on the list. Speaking of headlines, you had me thinking about it. Did you see what happened to Josh Allen maybe two weeks ago? Did you see that? No. They were cool. When did this happen? October 10th. October 10th. What is that? October 10th, the Thursday. So Josh Allen, what week was this? What week was this? So this must have been the six. We did not cover this. It came up in my class last night. We had a we had group presentation. So one of the students did a deep dive on like Tua and Josh Allen. So Josh Allen had what would appear to be, um, I think you mentioned something about uh, about the cutler, about slurring and stammering, whatever. Um, we know concussion like symptoms when we see it. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been on the show a couple of times talking about Tua, who speaking of Tua seems to be making on the verge of a comeback. So we'll save our comments for then. I think I, I think I saw somewhere that he's refusing to wear a guardian helmet. That's um, don't quite understand that, but whatever, neither here nor there. So we saw the Tua situation and every time it's happened to Tua, we can see his concussion like symptoms, like immediately, right? The fencing with his fingers or his inability to stand. Josh Allen had a weird moment. Um, this again was like two weeks ago. His head slammed to the ground and it looks like it looked like temporarily he was out, like out cold out. And then when he got up, he wasn't necessarily showing instability, which is normally the criterion under the CTA or under the CTE rules that like if you show gross motor instability, the spotter can get you and take you out. So Alan just like kind of, you know, this is this is probably a, you know, not a really fair way to explain it. But like it looked like he just passed out for a second. Maybe no one realized it. And he just closed his eyes and woke back up and he wasn't kind of, you know, wasn't showing signs of his concussion, at least per reports, right? So anyway, people thought it was odd. People said like, he seemed to have a concussion. He played really poorly the second half. Like, does he have a concussion? Everyone's like, no, he doesn't have a concussion. Like, guys, don't worry about it. He doesn't have a concussion. And my alarm bells go up as a Bills fan. You see over my head, I have the my Bills helmet over here. I'm like, I don't know. If he wasn't Josh Allen, would he have been taken out? And would we have assumed he had a concussion? Okay, so I, I have to read you this quote from Allen that we should, we should have discussed. Um, I don't know. I thought it was interesting. Are you ready for this? Oh, yeah. 
Okay. Alan's words from Wednesday. So this must have been October 9th. I obviously went into the tent. I can only control what I can control. What we talked about there, comma, they deemed me cleared to play, comma, and that's what happened. That's as deep as I'll get into it. So Alan has these weird comments that he was cleared by someone to play and he can only control what he can control. So I think we've we've stumbled upon another flaw in this concussion policy that a player maybe doesn't show gross motor instability, but look what Alan says. That's as deep as I'll get into it. So that's, I mean, we're not reading into it too much. Like he doesn't want to talk about it. Maybe the bills have said, like you and I were joking about Jordan Mason. This was like a couple of weeks ago. Like, don't say anything, Josh, just say this, say that you were clear to move on. But I'm not ready to say that nothing bad happened. And I don't root ill upon the bills, but we need to come up with a clear uniform concussion standard. So if a player like Josh Allen seems to have passed out on the field or a lower level player, a kicker or punter, a backup safety, like all of them should get the same treatment. Like just because Josh Allen's a starting quarterback for a fantastic team in the Buffalo Bills doesn't mean he should be treated differently from a concussion perspective. So I don't know for every two or three steps forward that that the league takes like neighbors, you know, obviously has been missing time on the giants. You know, I I see something like this and I'm like, how is this still happening? I I just don't understand, especially when there's cameras in every angle, there's perfect HD quality. I've saw the replay uh, minutes after it happened and, yeah, I had the same thought. Uh, he's knocked out cold because even his body kind of reacted in that way. It kind of seemed like it. So, uh, yeah, I, I just don't under, I, I, it's it, as much as they put the guidelines and rules in place. We're still obviously seeing things like Tua and uh, as much as Damar Hamlin has come back, Damar Hamlin, like the health and safety uh, can only go so far. So uh I don't know. I, I don't know what's going to come of this. And, you know, we're going to talk about Deshaun Watson as well. And that's another situation that I think is like, it just when it comes to health and safety of the players and I, I just don't, I don't, I don't know where it's going to go from here, but yeah, I'm interested to hear. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> interested to see where it goes, especially uh, once Tua comes back. I think this will all eventually lead to a full conversation again. I, I'm, you know, and again, we, we, I talked to this in my class last week, like, and again, we'll, we'll flag the two of stuff. Like I have Tyreek Hill on my fantasy team, Jalen Waddell, I have Raheem Mostert. Um, I'm like very invested in Dolphins for fantasy purposes. And like, do I, does part of me want to, to come back? Cause my, like Tyreek Hill sucks without him. Like, yeah, of course. Jalen Waddell is like a complete non-factor. All, all these players, do the players want him to come back? Like independent of the fantasy world, which the players don't give a flying F about, like they, the players want him to come back because all of their salaries and all their performance incentives, like it, it all depends on them. And like, obviously Tua doesn't want to let them down. Um, but that said, like there's so much research being done. And even if you saw what Josh Allen saying, like I can only control what I can control. There seems to be an undertone. That's like, sometimes these decisions should be taken out of my hands as the player. So I see it both ways. If you're like, you know, a player advocate, you want the player to be able to make the decision. Um, just like we talked about during the COVID wars, you know, when we were talking about whether Big Ten football should play or not, you want the player to be able to make the decision. But then again, like that's why these independent third party neurologists are put there to be able to say, yes, if player, if you want to play, you can play, but you still have to pass these independent neuro- neurological exams. It has to be safe for you to play. Like just because, you know, like, I don't know, certain people, and maybe this is not a fair example, but we'll, we'll roll with it for purposes of the show. It's like if you know, some people are not mentally stable to own, like, you know, to have certain weapons. We'll put it that way. I, don't, I know people are Second Amendment people, but like some people are not mentally stable to have those and they might want them, but that doesn't mean they should have them. And Tua, who, again, I, I respect the hell of him. I think he's a, a really a tremendous competitor, a tremendous athlete. Um, and I'm not I don't mean to single out Tua, but there has to be some mechanism that says if someone suffers uh, three concussions, four concussions. And then one of my students brought up that he had suffered a concussion. Um, he had at least reportedly found a note that he had suffered a concussion at Alabama. And I'm like, wait, all of a sudden we have like potentially five concussions in like not that long of a period of time. Like at what point is there an objective criterion that says you can't play? Like we got it. You really want to play? Like if Tua suffers another concussion, are we going to wait another year and he can play again? Or is there some, or, or can we have some level where there's an objective line that says like, 
you can't play at this point. Like you just have too many, like maybe that line needs to exist. I don't think it does, but I think that's the flaw. Like we just, there's too much subjectivity that depends on who you are. Right. Like I just, I think that's our, our main flaw with the concussion protocol. Yeah, I agree. I didn't. Yeah. Agreed. Kind of in the, I just don't understand how he continues to play uh, himself. Uh, I, in, I, up in high school, I had two major concussions and then another minor one. Like I stopped playing sports. Cause I'm like, that's, you know, I, I don't want to keep getting injured Foot, professional NFL football. I cannot imagine actually doing that. Like, I just can't, I can't imagine what's going through his head. I get the love of it. And uh, it seems like people around him, like his family and uh, from, I've seen reports are kind of weary about him playing again, but yeah, I guess we'll see in the next couple of weeks. Definitely uh, something to, uh, I'll, I'll put a flag on for uh, for topics. Um, we're watching it. We'll do this one quick. Jamison Williams, like, I feel bad. Another another Alabama alum. Like, I just I just feel bad. Like, the guy is finally breaking out. He had the p, you know, he had the gambling suspension. He got an injury, and he's finally like on the cusp of like being a real weapon for a Lions team that's like, you know, in the top three for Super Bowl favorite. And then like you get a PED suspension. Like, you know, at a certain point. You know, people have bad luck. Also, people just don't make smart decisions. So I don't, you know, we don't know what happened with this PD pop, you know, this uh, this positive test. But I don't know. It just at a certain point, it's like playing the NFL is a right. Sorry, it's 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 a privilege. It's not a right. And you can't keep having these little things like yeah, like everybody was aware of the gambling policy. He's the only one that, the really high level player that got popped for it. Um, everyone knows the PED policy. Like, I'm sure, oh, I didn't mean to take this. My nutritionist put something wrong. Like, I'm sure there's going to be any number of excuses that we hear. Um, I just think it's a really sad case. And it's like, you and I were just talking, if we're going to tie everything together, like objective criterion that if you have X amount of concussions, like an X amount of time, you can't play. Like, if there are PEDs in your system and, they're, and you're non-exempt, like, that's it. There's no, it doesn't matter to how it got in your system. It's like strict liability. It's like, that's it. Doesn't really matter. Doesn't matter if you if they didn't give you an advantage. Like I remember um, years ago, there was a kicker. I'm going to forget. Uh, he used to play. I think he was on the Saints, but he got popped for like ADHD medication. And there was some issue. Like I'm like, okay, is that like a performance enhancing drug? Like is that a PD? Like Ritalin? Like Adderall? Like that's that's on par with steroids? Like we're really going to say that? But if that's the rule, that's the rule. And and it's you know, it's collectively bargained for that those substances are, are zero tolerance. So like, what are you going to do about it? But um, I, I just, I think in this day and age, moving close to their concussions, but I, I digress. Um, let's do Deshaun. Uh, and then, uh, and then we'll talk some, uh, some NBA basketball. Mike, what's the latest? I know um, you actually, I, it's so funny in this day and age with like tech and, and everything else. Like I saw that clip. I saw, well, first I saw Jam- uh, Jameis Winston's statement that like, that's despicable. And I didn't like the cloud react, the crowd reactions. And I'm like, Oh, how did the crowd react to Deshaun Watson? I want to see this. So I popped on Twitter. I found a video, which did not seem to be a AI or, or edited video. Apparently it was. Um, that's why it's good. I didn't tweet it out. That's why it's good. You're here to fact check me for the podcast. Um, what was the real reaction? Were they just, were they, were they cheering? Yeah, there were some people that were cheering, some people that were booing, uh, that it, there was, it was scattered throughout. The video, because I saw the same video that you saw, um, and I actually, uh, on one of the accounts that I'd posted, I've been like, I said, uh, this is WWE, because uh, legitimately it was the, yeah, what was what was the exact? Uh, you deserve it. You deserve it, right. So you deserve it. Um, if you listen, and you're a WWE guy, I'm telling you, if you think, and you, you, you could just hear, because also as a video audio, like, you can just tell when something's not, that's not a stadium sound. That's an indoor sound like the the way the chants are you can hear that it's yes indoor that's and like, i was very impressed i was very impressed that's so fair. yeah you know uh gotta gotta spread the message of uh misinformation gotta watch out out there well i didn't spread it you caught me i didn't i did not tweet about it i just I thought about it in my own head um the reason we, we bring it up obviously we spent so much time filing uh following deshaun he'd settled his case we talked about it last week the browns had done everything in their power to keep this guy in the field like also like you know, I, I think it was a little odd that Jameis Winston was listed as the third string quarterback. Like, so the crowd wouldn't be chanting for Jameis to play. Like the whole thing is bizarre. Like, and, and 
I don't know. I, I'm sure just with, with salary cap purposes and cap hit purposes, they can't cut Deshaun Watson. He's gonna they're gonna give him a chance to come back. But like, you know, we've talked about a lot of bad trades in the history of football. Like Bryce Young is gonna go down, you know, hopefully the guy makes a comeback. But um, you know, I don't know, another weird trade, Herschel Walker weird trade, Ricky Williams weird trade. Like we can talk about all these weird trades. The the legal side of the Deshaun Watson trade, you know, we said at the time we was like he still could get indicted by the second grand jury. The first one cleared him. I'm like, and they're giving up three first round picks and they're giving him like, you know, hundreds of millions in guaranteed money. And then we talked about it in the Lamar Jackson sweepstakes, like how it helped Lamar's contract go up and, and nobody has copied Deshaun's contract. Like this will go down in epic proportions. And I've, I've wrote this like as a joke at the time, two years ago, I'm like, Deshaun Watson deserves an entire chapter in my sports law history book. I'm like, I wrote that. I was commissioned thereafter to write the college sports history book. Um, but at some point, Deshaun Watson deserves a chapter in all sports law history textbooks. I mean, it's still wild to me that this existed and happened. And, you know, I think we have a good amount of Cleveland Browns fans just over the years that have popped onto our show and popped into our listening audience. I I don't know. It's a little bit of karma for for trading such a huge package to get a guy with those much ac- accusations, like wanting him so bad, you give him all, all the draft capital, all the hundreds of millions. Like, you know, I think Deshaun was just cursed from the beginning once he gets to, gets to Cleveland. And I root, I root for Cleveland other than unless they're playing a New York team. Like I'm obviously rooting for the Yankees over the guardians. Like I want the Browns to be good. It just, um, but yeah, I'm buying stock in the Browns for the rest of the season. I think, I think the football gods want it that way. I hope so. I got Nick Chubb, but uh, I agree. Yeah. This is, this is actually this has to be the worst move in NFL history in terms of dollar amount. I mean, they're going to be on the hook for still his guaranteed salary for the next two years of 92 total million. And this year, all he has, all that the Browns have in terms of relief within his contract is the insurance policy that they took out on his salary for 2024 and a bit of obviously 2025 if he misses. But Outside of the Achilles tear, they're still on the hook for everything else. So he, like you said, he comes back and they, they almost have to play him because there's nobody. I mean, outside of maybe the Carolina Panthers that would take on something this ridiculous, uh, take on a contract this ridiculous. Why, of a why would the Panthers? On the, no one's going to want him. I mean, you would say that, but the Carolina Panthers, the way that they've been operating, uh, both that quarterback. No, they, and they'd get they'd get absolutely destroyed. Um, okay, so we covered the big ones: Cutler, James Williams, WNBA, CBA, and Deshaun. Okay, uh, Mike, are you ready for this? I think it's time for first betting segment of the year. Mike, can we have this? Can we have a name for the segment? Yeah, we got a. I got a. I got a brainstorm. Some I don't know the betting segment. Um, Connect Detrimental Resorts World and Casino is the sponsor of the segment, and it's just this is the segment Connect Detrimental Resorts World and Casino. Okay, so um, I have a, I have a one. It's just kind of some detective work that leads to bets. So my favorite bets, as you guys know, um, are bets where something happens in the news, we think about it, we think about how the news, something, be it an injury, a comment, uh, will impact a betting line, and that's just, I think. You know, I don't not just generally like, I don't know, like maybe sometimes I'm betting based on like, you know, something I see in the stats. But like I generally reserve my really big bets for something I see that I'm like pretty sure the line is going to move. So here's the bet. I already made it. If you can find a book that, that has this line still out there, by all means, take it. I think it's been taken off the off the boards most places. So four days ago. OK, this is this is when I got this money and very good. You ready for this, Mike? <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting here. Joel and Bede gave a statement to the media, okay? Do you know what I'm about to say? Yeah, I'm ready for it. I'm going to quote from, uh, uh, this is the easy way to explain it. The big man himself revealed that for this season and beyond, he won't be playing games on consecutive nights. Quote from Joel Embiid, if I had to guess, I would probably never play back-to-backs for the rest of my career. And then the article goes on to note that the team has 15 back-to-backs for the 24-25 season. Okay. Um, I saw that and I, I generally, I, you know, I, I have research. I like to know about my industries, basketball, football, everything I need to pay attention to. And I saw that. And I'm like, whoa, the betting line, because I'm generally aware of the betting lines, the betting line for the Sixers, the over under total is 52 and a half. And I go, if there's 15 back to back for the 24, 25 season, and he said something similar to this before that he needs to conserve himself for the playoffs. 
And he's not playing in any of those 15 games. Okay. And they're losing their best player. And we maybe he's not going to make, maybe not going to hold to this, but there's a decent chance that he's not going to play in those 15 games. Um, let's take the under 52 and a half. Last year, they won 47 games and it's Paul George's first year. Do we think Paul George is going to be a six win player? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe Joel Embiid is going to be more hurt than he was the year before. Maybe Max is going to get hurt. We have no idea. Um, Mike, the first thing I did, I saw that news article, and I go, please be on the board. Please be on the board. Went to the board, slammed it under 76ers, 52 and a half. That line has since moved on some sides. Some sides you can still find it at 52. Some sites it is still open, if you can find it, at 50 and a half. Um, obviously, like it more at under 52 and a half. But I just told you this, that the Sixers had a pretty good year last year, and they won 47 games. I still like it at under 50 and a half. So I'm going to put my stamp. Um, I'm rooting for under 52 and a half. But if we want to have a little podcast bet, we'll bring it up every couple episodes. I would, if you're listening to this episode, it's going to come out on uh, on Wednesday. Uh, the Sixers would not have played at that point, and the line will still be there. So I like under the Sixers this season. And it's it's unintentionally. I was in Philly last week. The people of Philadelphia were lovely. The people at Temple uh, Sports Law uh, and the Law Review uh, Ken Jacobson it was a lovely group of people, Professor Jacobson. Um, but you know, we got to follow the money. And the money says to bet Sixers under. Mike, are you rolling with me? Sixers under. I love it. I mean, I don't know if you saw too that Paul George dealing with the bone bruise. I don't know if, you know, how his. I see everything, Mike. Too, so. I see everything. You know, I, I'm also, hey, you know, like we are Knicks, Knicks fans. Okay. That's, you know. <laughs> hold, hold for the Knicks. I got one bet for you in the Knicks, and we'll call this episode that we'll keep this a pretty short episode, somewhat of a light week or so in, in sports law. Um, okay, Mike, big addition. You and I, did we talk about the cat trade? You like the cat trade? Just, um, just Yeah, I do. Uh, the I don't like the actual, you know, down and dirty details of it or exactly what we gave up, but um, understand the, ne- it's the necessity of it, and uh, I'm excited. Um. I'm excited to Knicks play tonight, Knicks Celtics tonight. Uh, and then interestingly, Lakers, Timberwolves tonight as well. So both teams involved in that trade are playing. So um, I, uh, a couple years ago, OG listeners will know, I once nailed a uh, Russell Westbrook to lead the league in assists, assists per game bet. That was like an eight to one. I nailed that. And that has receipts on Twitter. This is when I was tweeting lines out. So that was one of my more lucrative ones that was right up there with like Rafa Nadal, which I think I gave on the podcast 11 to one on the Novak Djokovic uh, vaccination stuff. I'm like, I'm pretty sure he's going to get kicked out of the country. And he was, and we won our ticket with Nadal 11 to one. I have one. This is not sports law based. I just feel pretty solid about it. And I, this is one where I think the line is just uh, wrong. Again, I could, I could be wrong. Um, I just think the line is incorrect. Uh, So uh, Mike, do you think um, personality wise, you think, how do you think, you think Cat is going to like, want to show out in New York and like, you know, go into cat mode a little bit like, you know, he's... yes, I think he's going to want to initially. Uh, and then uh, is, if this is a season long thing, I'm a little concerned maybe. Um, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to read you something to him. Um, cat was traded instead of Rudy Gobert. I think there were some conversations that Minnesota could have traded Rudy Gobert, um, but they didn't. And they traded cat. Why do I say that? Because they were both kind of competing for the same minutes at the center position. So Carl Anthony Towns has been in the league for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years. He's generally in the top 10 conversation for rebounds, except for the last two years. And those two years is when he played with one Rudy Gobert. I'm going to read you some numbers, okay? 10 and a half, 12.3, 12.3, 12.4, uh, 10.8, 10.6. And then 9.8. So those are his rebounding numbers before Rudy Gobert comes to Minnesota. In the last two years with Rudy in town, he goes eight rebounds, eight rebounds back to back. So we know we're going to get basically at least two more rebounds. Just the fact that he's out of Rudy Gobert's orbit, out of his gravitational pull. Mike, you following me so far? Oh, I'm, I'm very ready for this. Do you think Carl Anthony Towns is the type of guy that will want to have more rebounds than one Rudy Gobert who, who was not traded, okay? Rudy Gobert got to stay on Cat's team. It used to be Cat's team, and Rudy Gobert got to stay. I think of all people that Cat is going to look at this year, I think he's going to look very closely at Rudy Gobert and say, like, I'm a defensive player. He got all the credit. He got all these defensive player of the year awards, like, and votes. Like, I'm great at defense. I'm great at defense. I'm the greatest big man shooter of all time. And, like, I'm going to be better than Rudy Gobert, and I'm going to go back to what he's been doing. He's done his career, 12 rebounds a game. 
Mike, you think I'm about to tell you the over on uh, Cat's rebound line. I'm not going to say that. I have a much more bolder prediction. You ready for this? Interesting. Yeah. I'm, uh, now, I'm, now I'm interested even more. Oh, man. Last year, uh, Sabonis led the NBA in rebounds at 13.7. That was like somewhat of an outlier for him. Okay. 13.7. Number two in rebounds was one Rudy Gobert. Rudy Gobert en français. 12.9. Okay. 12.9 rebounds. And I've done a lot of deep diving on Cat because I want to make sure, you know, Cat's coming to our city and I got to make sure he fits in the right way. Um, he's a New Jersey guy, so I'm not saying it's our city. He's basically a New York, New Jersey guy anyway. I I am of the opinion that Cat is going to threaten for the re- most rebound rebounds per game. I think he's in the conversation. I think he's that type of personality. Rudy Gobert's right there. He's had 12 rebounds per game in the past, and there were only one, two, three. There were only four guys that had 12 rebounds per game last year. Sabonis at 13.7, Rudy Gobert 12.9, Anthony Davis 12.6, and Nikola Jokic uh, 12.4. Um, I think he could be a top five guy. And if he's a top five guy, I don't know, Todd should be like 10 to 1, 15 to 1, 20 to 1. Mike, as of right now, okay, Carl Anthony Towns to win have the most rebounds per game is 55 to 1. 55. So I did the research and I'm like, eh, 15 to 1. That's probably what I'll put it, 16 to 1. And I'm like, if it's 25 to 1, I'll... I'll probably probably take it 55 to one. Um, if you want to get really down and dirty, if you want to just, you know, you don't have to throw that much on it. You want to throw five bucks on it. There's the Bill Simmons boost. You get a 30% profit boost. You can take that bad boy to like 72 to one. Uh, I am, am an endorser. I, I, I think that cat is that crazy. He's going to want something. He's not going to lead the team in points. The Knicks probably a lot, much love the Knicks not going to win the title, but if cat's purpose is he can win most rebounds of the year. I think he'll do it. That's it. That's it. That's that. Carl Anthony Towns lead the NBA in rebounds per game, 55 to 1. Timestamp this. Cut it because I might want to say this. And if everyone's listening, that's the bet. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Throw $5 on it. That's a pretty good investment for 5 bucks. Can I give you some more, uh, back, give the listeners some more to it too? I mean, the Knicks got oh rid God, of, of two of their top three rebounders last year or two of their top four rebounders. They got rid of Hartenstein and Randall. So that's what, 17, 18 rebounds a game. And Mitch is hurt. And Mitch is hurt. So, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, come on. We got to, you know, <laughs> we gotta hammer it now. I, I, there's very few times in this one, I told, I don't really do this that often. I, I have a somewhat of a large wage on it, but I also placed a $5 boosted one. There's no harm to do it. Um, but sometimes I think these things through. There's some real deductive, lawyerly reasoning. At some point, maybe we'll do our own like gambling show, but this is a little, we just do a little bit of, a little bit of taste of it. But I've looked at it. I've analyzed it. I think 55 to 1 is, is really good run for your money. Could he end up with 10 rebounds? Sure. Um, which he's done his entire career. I think that's your floor. And if your floor is 10 rebounds per game, uh, and that's basically going to get you in like the top eight, I don't think it's a good bet. Um, Mike, that's it. That's all I got. I love it. I'm hammering it right now. Um, okay. That's a good place to end the episode. Um, go Knicks. Go Yankees. Go Yankees. Right? We're rooting for the Yankees here? No, I'm definitely not. I hope the Dodgers win in four. Yep. Friendly oh. bet you would friendly bet you and I. I'll take the I'll take the Yankees for the series. I right, listen. Look at this. Look over here. Who who do I hate? I have all these Giants bobbleheads. I hate the Dodgers. We're not rooting for the Dodgers. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I personally am. I would be so I was ten when the Yankees won last. Uh, I don't wanna see this. I don't wanna I am not a let's go New York person. I am a my team or no one else. I hope they all lose. Okay, but the Dodgers just beat your team, so you should hate them too. Um, not nearly as much. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> friendly friendly wager. We'll come up with the terms. We'll figure this out. Um, that'll do it for us here. We appreciate you guys each and every week turning on to us. Um, we've been putting out the Connect Detrimental newsletter every Friday. Alexis Castillo, one of our new contributors, has been taking the lead on that. Uh, the Conduct Dimensional 10 Under 10 was officially released. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Steph, for coming up with the graphic. Uh, it is out now. It's a fun exercise. I know we're going to have some listeners of the podcast that applied to be 10 Under 10 and didn't get it. Don't be mad. Uh, don't be mad at anybody because it's, it's a group process. Um, but uh, we are going to continue to roll people over year over year. And listen, if you were very close to getting 10 Under 10 in your fourth year or fifth year, you have five more years to only get better. So, um Listen, we're, we're out here to help, uh, and please don't be mad. Please don't be mad. Please don't be mad. But we can only pick 10. We, I knew people are going to be mad. I'm already getting mad texts from people. But we're trying to do a good thing. So um, uh, the worst case is you didn't get an award you didn't have before. Listen, I'm trying. I'm trying not to get people mad at me, but sometimes it happens. Um, we love you. We love all of our listeners. We appreciate you turning in each and every week. And we will be back, Mike, once again next week on a brand new episode 
of conduct detrimental.